Over the past generation, we've witnessed a great shift in our understanding of the mind-body awareness and compassion practices commonly known as mindfulness. And now, in light of the reawakening to racism sparked by the horrific killing of George Floyd, we are experiencing a similar shift in consciousness, one in which we're called to reckon with the legacies of white supremacy and the harms that result when racial prejudice and systemic power intertwine. What I'd like to share with you here is how you can bring these two shifts in consciousness together in your own life. In my work as a law professor and a mindfulness teacher, I have seen how relationship-focused, healing-centered mindfulness can support the work of racial justice, which I define as love in action for the alleviation of racism and its harms against us all. To be clear, I focus on racial justice not because other types of justice don't matter, they do, but because we cannot fully address other forms of justice without addressing racial justice. I have been teaching about racism in the context of law and culture for many years. And along the way, I've learned two important things. The first is that although we may not know all of the historical details, most of us know a lot more about white supremacy in our bodies and in our bones than we have been raised to see or to say. And the second is that coming together to examine racism causes us a lot of stress to the point that without supportive practices, we are practically bound to fail before we even start. Scientists have been telling us for decades that race, the social construct created to serve the political and economic needs of exploitative systemic racism, is a biological fiction, but it's a fiction that we've been taught to believe is real. And as a result, it has very real consequences in our lives. What's more, our cultures train us in subtle ways of racializing people, that is identifying ourselves and even others in terms of race, and then believing that these racialized identities have predictable behaviors and attributes that justify the inequities we see in the world. The painful truth is that we've inherited a world built by systems of white supremacy. We live in these systems, and these systems live in us. At the same time, in recent decades, we've been taught that the goal of anti-racism should be to become colorblind, to not see race or its consequences at all. Not surprisingly, then, conversations about race are generally filled with so much anxiety that we often turn away out of feelings of fear, frustration, or futility. And as a result, action for positive change is stalled again and again. Unlearning what has been so deeply ingrained in all of us is not easy. It requires intentional efforts to expand perception, to deepen awareness of how race and racism operate both within and around us, and to develop the stamina for staying engaged. So we each have work to do. And compassionate mindfulness can help. I call this the inner work of racial justice. Of course, the precise nature of the work will be different for every single one of us. For example, the work to be done by a black man considering Native American objections to the name of his favorite football team will be different from the work to be done by an Asian heritage woman grappling with the systemic reasons why black men are underrepresented in her workplace. And for people racialized as white, the work may be very different still. It may require stretching to understand just how racializing practices cause harm to people of color, as well as overcoming the feelings of shame, fear, anxiety, or potential loss that may come up when white people think about what might be needed to achieve greater racial equity. Let me give you an example from my own practice. As a little girl, 
I received subtle teachings in colorism, a dimension of racism that people of color sometimes internalize, a preference for lighter skin over darker. An aunt of mine once told me to avoid marrying a dark-skinned man. Now, the memory of this is painful, even shameful, even as I stand here right now. But we all carry memories of moments like this when the biases in our society have been presented for us to absorb. Seeing them is just the first step in interrupting their harmful effects. So as we awaken to the imprints and ghosts of racism in our own lives and seek to create more racially just outcomes for all of us, we have to take action separately and together. Mindfulness can help us in this as well. Now, mindfulness is often defined as the practice of paying attention in an open, compassionate, and non-judgmental way, and the way of being that often results. While there are many ways that this can assist us in fighting racism, I want to focus on just three. First, mindfulness can help deepen our awareness of racism and how it causes harm, both in our own lives and in the lives of others. Now, as you engage in anti-racist work, you may find, as I did, that you need to heal from the racial wounds that you have suffered in your own life. Mindfulness can support you and your community in this important step. Now, on the other hand, if you seek to be an ally to others, mindfulness can help you see the legacies of white supremacy that you have been trained not to see and understand its harms more clearly. Thus, if you have not experienced racism much in your own life, as is true for many white racialized people and some people of color too, mindfulness can help you in learning how it operates and discerning how to disrupt it. Now, when you use mindfulness to look closely at the social context in which we live, you can more readily see the often subtle rules and structures that give some people opportunity while at the very same time shutting out so many. Many participants in my classes describe arriving at deeper racial insights like these, what I call in contrast to color blindness, color insight. For example, there was a white racialized young man who came to see how he had actively avoided learning about race rather than simply never having seen race or racism as he had grown accustomed to believing. And then there are the students who find themselves surprised by feeling deep connections to classmates from racial backgrounds different from their own through listening to their unique stories. In short, Mindful awareness of race and racism reveals our innate ability to connect with one another in ways that are essential if we are to keep working to dismantle oppressions. Now, the second benefit that mindfulness offers is that it increases our compassionate resilience, helping us develop the stamina necessary for anti-racist engagement over a lifetime. The work of racial justice requires, as we all know, more than just a few moments of racial awareness. It requires an ongoing commitment. And to stay in this awareness as we work for change, even a heartfelt desire to make the world a better place is simply not enough. We need practices that help us deal in an ongoing way with discomfort, sadness, fear, rage, and grief, the strong reactions and emotions that are predictable whenever we turn toward this aspect of our lives. And we need places where we can learn, where we can make mistakes and be vulnerable so that we can build up inside ourselves the sense that, yes, we can do this. Sometimes working within our own racial affinity groups and at other times working across lines of racial identity. Mindfulness enables us to hold the complexity of multiple realities and develop the emotional intelligence to respond rather than react to everything we may experience, including the cognitive and emotive dissonances that arise when we come together to discuss our different perceptions of, say, the same set of facts. 
mindful breathing and movement, loving kindness and empathy practices have all been shown to help build the relational resilience necessary to turn toward each other rather than away and to do the work rather than just coast along in our unjust systems, particularly when faced with resistance, fragility, and other defenses against vulnerability. And mindfulness has been demonstrated to assist us with both minimizing our own biases and protecting us against the threats to our well-being that bias often poses. It allows us to develop the equanimity for staying in the work and to cultivate the fierce power of love to make a difference. And I know something about all of this from my own experience. As a black woman, regardless of whatever successes I may have achieved, racism has always been a very real threat to my own well-being. And like anyone else, I've struggled with my own biases. It wasn't until I started exploring mindfulness that I began to reconnect with and actually feel a way of grounding myself in a sense of belonging despite it all, and tapping my inner resources for doing the work that is mine alone to do. The third benefit that flows from using mindfulness in the work of racial justice is this. It can deepen the ethical foundation for the work, anchoring it in a broader effort to remake the world in ways that help everybody. Mindfulness has been criticized for focusing too much on individual introspection and personal well-being and not enough on socially conscious engagement with and for the benefit of others. But here's the thing, true mindfulness is so much more. Rather than rendering us passive, these practices open our frames on reality, allowing us to see relationships between people and things that have been hard to see. They energize our capacity to recognize the wonder of the generous planet that we share that miraculously sustains us and the moral implications of the radical interconnectedness that we share with all of our fellow human beings. Now, when applied to racial justice, mindfulness can lead to the understanding that a racial injury against one is an injury to us all and that correcting against racism helps liberate every one of us. As the late Congressman John Lewis often said, echoing Dr. Martin Luther King, we are one beloved community. We are all brothers and sisters. We all live in the same house. And I believe that this community, this family, this house, each of these is global. If we can get past our fears, we will discover that embracing our connections to each other, the joy, and yes, even the vulnerability of that feels so much better than living separated and heavily defended lives. Indeed, managing our fears and building a more just world may actually be the key to our literal survival in these times. Studies suggest that as inequality increases, average health and well-being indicators decrease and vice versa. In short, Racism kills and justice heals. For me, remembering and drawing strength from our common humanity is like walking myself home to a stabilizing, comforting, grounding space from which we can dream our biggest dreams and live our fullest lives. And as I realized at a recent conference held by the Institute for Mindfulness in South Africa, this is more than just a metaphor. The conference was held at the Cradle of Humankind, a world heritage site that is the home to the largest concentration of early human ancestral remains anywhere in the world. Anthropologists believe that this is the region on the planet from which all ancestors of the human beings alive today originate. Being there was a reminder of a simple, powerful truth obscured by racism that although our many brothers and sisters' faces may look very different from our own, we are truly just one human family. My teacher and friend, the great John Kabat-Zinn, is fond of saying, if you're breathing, there's more right with you than wrong with you. 
Now, I believe we can take this truth one step further. Wherever we are right now, and despite all the legacies of racism among us, as long as we are breathing, there is more right with our lives together in this multicultural world than there is wrong with it. We must remember this and honor each other's humanity as we seek justice. And from this place, we can experience the personal justice of healing the wounds of racism wherever they exist. We can feel our inherent belonging and that of others. And we can deepen our individual and collective ability to do justice and to thrive in this very life. The power of mindfulness to support us in doing racial justice work inspires great faith in me that better days lie ahead. Indeed, doing the inner work of racial justice may be the single best path we can take toward accepting the great invitation of this time to do what we can to walk ourselves, one another, and humanity itself back home. Thank you.